Welcome back everyone, I'm Jordan Giesecke, and this is The Limiting Factor. When Tesla unveiled the Semi five years ago, the auto industry was skeptical to say the least. As Daimler put it, Tesla must be defying the laws of physics. With the Semi now on the road reaching 500 miles of range, clearly no new physics are required. However, this begs the question, why did so many people assume that the Tesla Semi was just smoke and mirrors? In short, it was a failure of imagination. There were, of course, the obvious opportunities to improve efficiency, like the aerodynamics of the semi or ensuring that energy is used efficiently throughout the powertrain. But there were also some non-obvious opportunities, like synergies between the triple plaid motor powertrain and the 900 kilowatt hour battery pack that Tesla didn't talk about in the semi delivery event. Before we begin, a special thanks to my Patreon supporters and YouTube members. This is the support that gives me the freedom to avoid chasing the algorithm and sponsors. As always, the links for support are in the description. To kick things off, let's start with the obvious reasons why the Tesla Semi was able to achieve 500 miles of range. Then we'll get into the not-so-obvious. Many people know that the Semi has a drag coefficient that's almost half that of a diesel Semi, and even better than a Bugatti supercar. A drag coefficient is simply a measure of how efficiently an object moves through the air. Lower resistance means greater efficiency and therefore range. However, it doesn't take into account the amount of air that the object displaces. Greater surface area also increases total drag. Therefore, although it's cool that the Semi has a slicker aerodynamic shape than the Bugatti, it's not the best comparison because the Bugatti is so much smaller. The better comparison is the diesel truck, which has a much higher drag coefficient and has a similar surface area to the Tesla Semi. We'll take a look at how the Tesla Semi compares to other electric semis later in the video. Next, the powertrain. A typical electric vehicle has roughly 86% battery to wheel efficiency. Roughly 5% of the energy is lost in the battery itself due to electrical and chemical inefficiencies. 5% is lost to converting DC power from the battery to AC power for the motors, and 5% of the energy is lost to inefficiencies in the motor. This means that 14% of the energy is lost to heat rather than generating forward motion. But that's a typical electric vehicle. For a Tesla and other well-engineered electric vehicles, 3% is lost in the battery itself, 1% converting DC to AC power, and 3% is lost to inefficiencies in the motor. This means, at most, a Tesla has a total efficiency of 93% from battery cell to wheel. However, bear in mind that the 93% figure is a peak efficiency figure. The average efficiency is probably around 90%. Overall, Tesla's powertrain efficiency advantage of 4% over a typical electric vehicle doesn't seem like much, but as we'll see, it adds up. As a side note, if you're curious where I got the efficiency numbers from, it was from a 2021 Car and Driver magazine article on the Tesla Plaid Model S. Bear in mind, the Car and Driver article was poorly written from a technical perspective, so I had to interpret it as best I could. Regardless, you'll find that the 93% and 90% figures I arrived at roughly align with the article. Moving along, the aerodynamic and powertrain efficiencies compound on each other along with other innovations like Tesla's octavalve and heat pump system to provide about 20% greater efficiency than a typical electric vehicle. There are outliers such as the Lucid Air that aren't shown on this chart, but in most cases, Tesla is usually best in class. But is the same true for the Tesla Semi versus other electric semis? Yes. This summary table from EV Universe shows that the Tesla Semi is nearly twice as efficient as the worst performing semi, the BYD 8TT, and it's about 18% better than the next best performer, the Volvo VNR Electric. Considering that the Tesla Semi has a battery pack that's about 62% larger and heavier than the Volvo, how is it that the Tesla Semi is still significantly more efficient? I think there's more that's going on here beyond just aerodynamics and better electronics. My view is that the Tesla Semi actually gets some surprising leverage from its larger battery pack and triple motor setup. First, it's worth noting that, at the unveiling of the Semi, Tesla said the vehicle would use four motors. However, in the production version of the Semi, it only uses three. This means Tesla was able to remove weight from the vehicle, which will increase range and efficiency. How was Tesla able to remove one of the motors in the production version? This is where Tesla's plaid motor comes in. 
The Plaid motor was unveiled by Tesla in 2021 along with the newest version of Tesla's Model S sedan. Rather than using a steel jacket to hold the rotor of the electric motor together, the Plaid motor uses carbon fiber. This allows the Plaid motor to reach higher RPM before the rotor at the center of the motor flies apart, which means higher power density. Additionally, the thin carbon fiber wrap on the rotor of the Plaid motor should reduce parasitic magnetic fields at high RPM as compared to an electric motor with a steel sleeve, which may also help improve power output. There's a lot more to the Plaid motor than that, and I eventually plan on doing a deep dive on it. What all this means is that the Plaid motor delivers about 35% higher power at high RPM and maintains that power to 20,000 RPM at high efficiency. This both allowed Tesla to remove a motor and gear the motor for high RPM heavy load use cases like the Semi. For the Plaid Model S, those 20,000 RPM are geared to propel a 2-ton sedan from 0 to 60 in 2 seconds on a vehicle with a top speed of over 200 miles per hour. For the semi, Tesla used the same 20,000 RPM motors and geared them to propel a 40-ton vehicle from 0 to 60 in 20 seconds on a vehicle that probably has a top speed of around 85 miles per hour. Interestingly, Tesla could have gotten away with two motors or even one motor on the Tesla Semi, and it still would have been able to accelerate at the same speed as a diesel Semi from 0 to 60. In fact, the Volvo VNR I mentioned earlier has two electric motors that put out 400 kilowatts of power, which is about half the power of the Tesla Semi. Furthermore, the Volvo needs a two-speed transmission. The Tesla Semi doesn't need a transmission with more than one gear because their motors are so powerful and have such a high RPM limit. They can just use one gear and rev it up to 85 miles per hour. This begs the question, why did Tesla put three motors on the Tesla Semi if they weren't necessary to keep up with the power of a diesel Semi? Once again, it comes back to efficiency. First, the use of three motors allows Tesla to optimize one of the motors for cruising speed. This allows the other two motors, which are geared for acceleration, to disengage at cruise speed. We saw something similar with the old Tesla Model S P85D. By adding an electric motor, they were able to improve the range of the dual motor Model S by more than 11% over the single motor version by optimizing one motor for acceleration and one motor for highway cruising. Second, three electric motors allows the Tesla Semi to recapture more energy through regenerative braking than a typical Tesla vehicle, and it may not be for the reasons you think. Let's look at a Tesla Model 3 to get a better understanding of what's going on here. An all-wheel drive Tesla Model 3 is able to regenerate around 70 kilowatts with two electric motors. Obviously, a Tesla Semi that weighs 20 times as much will need to recapture at least an order of magnitude more power. So what's the limiting factor here and how can we break it? For the Model 3, the roughly 70 kilowatt regen limit is software limited. But why the software limit? It's most likely to maximize battery life. Yes, performance Model 3s with roughly the same motors and battery pack can regen up to 100 kilowatts with track mode. But that vehicle has a higher profit margin and Tesla can afford the extra potential warranty claims from intermittent track abuse. Some might also argue that the regen limit of 70 to 100 kilowatts can't be due to battery limitations because a Model 3 can accept up to 250 kilowatts of power on a Tesla supercharger. The catch is that it can only accept 250 kilowatts when the battery is both at a low state of charge and when the battery pack's gone through a preconditioning cycle to increase the charge uptake. Even then, it takes a minute or two for the battery to spool up from 100 kilowatts to 250 kilowatts of power. That's not a luxury the vehicle has under spontaneous braking loads. So if I'm correct and the battery is the limiting factor for regenerative braking, then a larger battery pack with a larger energy reservoir should allow for more energy to be recaptured during each braking event. The semi battery pack has roughly 900 kilowatts of usable energy storage. This is over 11 times the energy stored in a 78.5 kilowatt hour Model 3 battery. That means rather than accepting 70 kilowatts of regen power like the Model 3 battery pack, the semi battery pack should be able to comfortably accept 770 kilowatts of regen power. However, can the triple motor setup of the Plaid powertrain regenerate that much power? It appears so. The Plaid powertrain in the Model S can pump out over a thousand horsepower. 
If those motors are used to generate power rather than use it, and 1,020 horsepower is 760 kilowatts of power, then everything falls neatly into alignment. 760 kilowatts of regen power paired with a battery pack that can comfortably accept 770 kilowatts of power. That is, my view is that the primary purpose of the triple motors of the semi doesn't appear to be acceleration and powering up hills with ease, but rather so that the semi doesn't need to use its brakes. This means the semi can harvest every bit of kinetic energy while going down hills and braking, turning it into chemical energy for the battery rather than thermal energy like it would if the brakes were used. And that means the 500 mile range version of the semi may gain some efficiency advantages over other semis on the market that have smaller battery packs. This is because the larger battery pack and triple motors might allow it to soak up every drop of energy on steep downhill runs that might overwhelm a smaller battery pack. As usual, this is educated speculation on my part, so let me know what you think in the comments below. Lastly, the Tesla Semi is getting an upgrade from Tesla's typical 3 to 500 volt architecture to a 1000 volt architecture. Does this offer any efficiency benefits? Yes, but the extent depends on how Tesla leveraged the extra voltage. Increasing the voltage of an electrical architecture can actually be leveraged in several ways. It can be used to reduce wire thickness to reduce costs, increase power output, or improve efficiency by reducing heat generation. A good way to think of it is the triangle on screen. By increasing the voltage, you can focus on one corner of the triangle or pick a combination of benefits. Optimizing for one corner of the triangle naturally moves you further from the other corners. Trade-off decisions are required. That is, we know that Tesla will derive benefits from the 1000 volt architecture, but the extent of those benefits and where they were applied is something we won't know until there's a teardown of the Tesla Semi. In summary, why did Daimler say the Tesla Semi was breaking the laws of physics, and why did Bill Gates say that the Tesla Semi would probably never work? It's because they reasoned by analogy. They looked at current semis on the market and seemed to assume that an electric semi would be the same thing as a diesel semi, except carrying 5 tons of extra battery weight. That is, they failed to look at electric semis with an open mind and to design from a blank sheet of paper and didn't ask the right questions. For example, what if we make the brakes redundant by pairing the large battery pack with extra motors to capture every bit of kinetic energy rather than wasting that energy as brake heat? That means any energy spent on an uphill or accelerating could be recaptured on the downhill or decelerating. In the case of Tesla, that would be about 90% of the energy recaptured. Next, what if we optimized one of the three motors for cruising speed and disengaged the other two motors to maximize energy efficiency at highway speeds? Finally, why don't we reshape the semi so that it's smooth and bullet-like, rather than just taking a typical semi-tractor and sticking some batteries in it? I do think that the Tesla Semi may have lost some cargo capacity compared to a diesel Semi, but nowhere near enough to make the Semi commercially unviable. According to BatteryDesign.net, the Tesla Semi probably weighs about 2.4 tons more than a typical Semi. However, electric Semis are also allowed leeway of an extra ton. So overall, the Semi loses at most about 1.4 tons of cargo capacity, which is about a 7% cargo penalty. With that said, we also have to take into account that semis often aren't carrying their maximum rated cargo weight anyways, and the fact that the Tesla Semi will be about 17% cheaper to operate. So even with a cargo handicap, not only is the Tesla Semi possible, it's a much more profitable option for routes that are within its 500 mile range. Before I close things out, I want to say a big thanks to Here We Go Again on Twitter. The discussions we had after the semi event massively upgraded my understanding of superchargers, electric motors, and inverters. That saved me days or weeks of research and a lot of potential errors. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting me on Patreon with the link at the end of the video or as a YouTube member. You can find the details in the description. A special thanks to my YouTube members and all the other patrons listed in the credits. I appreciate all of your support, and thanks for tuning in.